Well, if you haven't yet seen Aging Wheels videos on this, I have in fact bought this weird little Japanese car. And I have what I'm sure will be a very rambly video for you about a small problem it has, which I am attempting to fix with this mass airflow sensor cleaner. So I've been wanting to make some videos about the extent to which cars are computerized and have been for a very long time. This is a 1991 so nearly 30 years old, and it is pretty much just as computer controlled as an engine would be today. A few things are not the same. For instance, it has an actual cable operated throttle and stuff like that, but this ECCS is actually what Nissan called the uh, electronically controlled combustion system. So this engine, like pretty much all engines in the past uh, 35 years is hard, is mechanically, a real engine but electronically or is controlled almost entirely electronically. Uh, the ignition timing can be altered through that coil over there. The distributor is basically really just well you can't see it from this side but the distributor is basically just pointing the current from the coil to one of the spark plugs. Uh, I might be wrong about that but I'm pretty sure that it can retard and advance the timing electronically via the computer. And everything on here is controlled by a computer. Now, what it the problem that it has, it has had ever since I got it, and Robert did not cause it, so don't worry if you're watching this, and that is it has a... it is hard to start when it's room temperature cold. If it's very cold, like near freezing, it seems to start okay. Uh, but when it is room temperature cold, which it is now, it typically starts and stalls. The other thing is that when it is uh, running, it under moderate throttle tends to have a bit of a surging. You know, the engine will be like and you know, no big deal, works fine. But that obviously is a sign of a problem. So one of the things that it might be is a dirty mass airflow sensor. The starting issue is probably not that, but the surging might be. So what does a mass airflow sensor do? Well, as I said, the engine is computer controlled. A computer is monitoring everything that this engine is doing. It is not at all like a lawnmower that just is entirely mechanical. It is very much computer controlled. So the first thing, oh, and I should say, like I said, very rambly, this is Conextras, it's what you get. Why do we do this? Well, because we need the fuel to burn exactly as precisely as we can for emissions control. We're trying to knock down nitrous oxide emissions and to do that, you want the fuel to be burning stoichiometrically. How do you do that? Well, you need to know exactly how much air has entered the engine, and you want to monitor that after it's been burned through the use of oxygen sensors. So the mass airflow sensor, which I have removed, is this thing. Let me take it out of the, uh, off the dashboard. Now these are extremely delicate devices. Those very thin wires are what it uses to determine how much air is flowing into the engine. And I believe, don't quote me on this because I haven't looked it up, that all th all it is is there are a couple of um, basically resistors that it... Can you focus on that a little better? Let me just try. Hang on. Okay, so there's a couple of resistors and they... Ba what I think it does is it just heats them up periodically and sees how quickly did it... or it monitors the resistance to see how quickly it... Um, cools down, essentially. And it can calculate how much air is flowing past it. And you'll see they're staggered a bit, so I'm sure that helps it. This is, from what I have seen, a very atypical mass airflow sensor, especially because it is only partially in the, in the airstream. But anyway, this sensor allows the computer to know exactly how much air in grams is entering the engine. So that's why it's called mass airflow, because it's the air in mass, grams per second. So where this sensor lives, is in that little hole. So the air filter is in there, it's past the air filter and it monitors how much air the engine is actually ingesting. From there, it will calculate how much fuel should be put into the engine. So you've got the fuel injectors down here and it can control extremely precisely how much fuel is going into the engine on every single uh, combustion event. Um, and then the final check is the oxygen sensors, and those are in the exhaust. And truthfully, I do not know where they are on this car because I haven't looked it up. And I think there might only be one. And the exhaust, the oxygen sensor serves basically as feedback to determine 
is the mass airflow sensor or is the math it's doing correct? So the oxygen sensor will be going back and forth between rich and lean, and the computer wants to see that it's feathering that just perfectly. So that surging it's getting could be a result of that feathering, especially if the mass airflow sensor is incorrectly reporting something to the car. They get dirty over time. This car is 30 years old, and while it looks pretty clean, that's not at all focused correctly. There we go. While it looks pretty clean, there's really no way to know. And you should, by the way, never touch that because it's extremely fragile. And I have no idea where I could find a replacement. But it is a Hitachi part. So I imagine it's not, you know, extraordinarily rare. But who knows? So what I want to do is I'm going to clean the mass airflow sensor and see if it will start without doing a start stall. I don't expect this to fix that because while there are, it can cause starting issues on more modern cars i really don't think that's the starting issue with this car what it probably is let me get on the other side on the back of the throttle body this part is a known failure point on figaro's and this is what they call the cold idle valve. Um, I want to say it's an idle air control valve. And the computer may or may not have any control over this. I honestly don't think it does, but it, there's a vacuum line going to it, so maybe. Um, and this is essentially what allows it to control idle speed. Because on an old car like this, this is the throttle right here. So it's actually actuated by the gas pedal. And the computer has no control over this. So in order to control idle speed, there's a little bit of a bypass in this valve. And normally it would be called the idle air control valve. I don't know if this operates the same way, but this is a known problem which causes hard cold starts. And the other thing is the idle speed of this car is really, really high. On a related note, that's why I asked Robert to replace the uh, engine coolant temperature sensor because I thought, it might just think the engine's cold all the time. So let's replace that in case that's a problem. But that was not the problem. <laughs> so no, no worries though. The car is completely drivable and this is a very minor complaint. But the reason why, going back, why I suspect the mass airflow sensor, which again lives in that hole, could be the problem is that the when I first picked up the car from Robert, it had set the cam crank relation code. When I first got the car, that code was in it. It was code 11. And I figured out, uh, I found a code sheet about what that meant, and I was able to clear the codes. Now, I've basically had the codes cleared the entire time I've had the car, and so that was my experience of normal. When I picked it up from Robert, it was driving better. It had a lot more power than it typically does. Then I checked codes and saw that code 11 was in it again. So I cleared the codes and then it was driving worse. So my suspicion is in closed loop mode, when it's actually monitoring the fuel, one of the inputs of the computer is wrong because it doesn't, it's not calculating the, the fuel correctly. And this is basically the first input it gets. So if this is faulty, it could run like poop. Now, on the other hand, the problem could be the oxygen sensors or sensor if there's only one and I will be looking into replacing that if this doesn't solve my problem uh, but you know a spray can of mass airflow sensor cleaner is, is cheaper and easier to find than an oxygen sensor for this car it's not hard to find at all I can get it from the Figaro shop but we're trying this first because it's easy so I really don't expect it to fix the start stall but it might fix that surging issue and we'll find out shortly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the mass airflow sensor outside and use the cleaner on it, and then I will reinstall it and we'll see if it starts without needing some intervention. Okay, it is back. That's where it lives. Uh, I need to, I forgot about this part. The wire for it has a little bracket there that I got to sneak it in there and then bend it back. It has a really weird connector. You have to remove that metal clip up to remove it. Uh, and I don't know if you caught this, but it was definitely removed before because there was some sort of a lubricant around the O-ring that I very much doubt was original because it's still, you know, soft. But maybe. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, so that's reinstalled. The thing I totally forgot to mention when I was talking about computer controls is the last part, which is the catalytic converter, which 
is not controlled by the computer whatsoever, but it does get rid of any unburnt fuel and helps clean the emissions further. And part of why it needs to monitor the fuel is because you can destroy the catalytic converter if you are not careful. And on this car, even though it has all sorts of computer controls, it does not have a check engine light. The six warning lights are uh, seat, or no, the brake warning light, seat belts, low oil pressure, this is your rear window defogger switch, and then low voltage. And this one is a very simple light, and if it goes on, you have a problem, because this is the catalytic converter overheat light. And if that comes on, it will never go out until you replace the catalytic converter, essentially, because there's a little, uh, a little thermal fuse that will basically short out when it gets too hot, and that light will be on forever until you replace that fuse. So this car does not have a check engine light. The way you check codes on it is really absurd. Uh, over there in the kick panel on the passenger side, if you can see those two little plugs, you remove those, and then on the bottom one, there's a hole that you put in a screwdriver, and on the top, there are two LEDs, green and red, and you turn the screwdriver a certain way to get it to show you the codes, and then they will blink, green and red. So two green blinks and five red blinks is code 25. I might have that backwards, it might be red first. But so that's how you uh, read the codes from it, and then there's a certain way to clear it as well. Uh, so that's how I read code 11. And then the other thing, it's very rambly, I know, is that the cam sensor on this car, because the other thing about these computer controls is that there are sensors which tell the computer exactly where the engine is. So it can know in its rotation which piston is coming up for which part of the cycle, down to very fine amounts. And in this car, the cam sensor, for whatever reason, is in the distributor. So the cam sensor is in there, which is really weird, and if, you, if it goes bad, you basically need a new distributor. So that's annoying, and when I had, uh, when I first researched code 11, which is very vague from the code sheet that I found, it was basically like there could be an error between the cam and crank relationship, or it could even mean that your distributor is not connected. And I was like, that sounds wrong, so I unplugged the distributor and sure enough, the car will not run without that signal. So if that's not what the problem is. I suspect the code was set um, probably when Robert was doing all the work for me, either taking the distributor cap off or the timing belt change, but the timing belt change obviously is fine because it runs fine. Um, and like I said, it had the code when I first got the car, but I cleared it and it never came back to my knowledge. So I don't know why that code appeared, but this is where the cam sensor is for this car. It's inside the distributor. And in fact, I don't know if it has a separate crank sensor. I think it does, uh, but not sure. But anyway, that's what I mean. Is I would like to make some videos on the main channel, probably not with this car because I can't connect a code scanner to it. It's just a little too old. But that just overview all of the various computer controls that are in a car, because I think people don't, they, you hear a lot of people who are like, oh, they don't make cars like they used to. And they think about, oh, there's so many electronics in cars these days. And it's like, well, there have been since the 80s. There's really, you haven't had a truly mechanical car since probably the late 70s. I would imagine even in the late 70s, engine computers started to become a thing because they were getting cheap enough. I don't know exactly the, the cutoff, but definitely in the US, anything made from 96 or newer is going to have an OBD2 port and you can talk to it, but since A, this is older than 96, and B, this is from Japan, it has all sorts of weird standards that I have no clue what they might follow. I do appreciate how, you know, a lot of these warning labels are in Japanese and stuff like that, like that guy. It's pretty neat. This car is definitely a guilty pleasure. Nothing whatsoever that I need. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun, and I really do enjoy having it. But what I have to do right now is wait another 10 minutes before I start it, because I just want to make sure all that stuff has evaporated off of the sensor. And then I will bring you with me to start it, but it might be about to rain, so I will probably not bring you on a drive, because also I won't be driving right away. But I'm going to wait another 10 minutes or so before I start it, and we'll see if, hopefully, the starting issue is gone. I very much doubt it will be gone, 
because like I said, it's, it's probably that guy that's a problem. And what I will do is remove it and try to clean it before I buy a new one because a replacement is like 160 bucks. Um, and if I can clean it with brake clean or carburetor cleaner or something, even if it only works for another year, that'd be nice. But it will also be nice to confirm that that is in fact the problem. And then I also got to look through the shop manual to find out what should the idle speed be. Does the computer actually have control over it? It should because it has air conditioning. But the other thing is a lot of cars of this vintage with an automatic and air conditioning have relatively high idle speeds anyway. But like it idles at 1500 RPM, which is a lot. It does have a tiny little 987 cc engine, but still that seems kind of high. Anyway, I'll be back in a bit. Okay, I've waited long enough, and it is about to rain, so definitely won't be going on a drive, but I did want to show you, because I don't think Robert showed this in the video. Look at the dome lights on this car. I just love that. Next to the mirror. Oh, hi, there's my head. See. That's just a lovely touch. I know I only, I have the garage door down, the back door is open, but don't worry. The top's down. That's a joke. I'm only going to run it for briefly. So let's see if it will start without complaining. My guess is no. Nope. That's still a problem, so you gotta give it some gas. And the weird thing is, once it clears its throat, it's completely fine. So now it's probably going to be okay and then raise up the RPM a bit. Yep, I have no idea why it does that. But it's running, that's good. Ah, empty the key out. All right, it's not. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, the car's park neutral switch is a little messed up, so I often have to put it in neutral to get it to start. I'm wondering why the key won't come out. That's why. Okay. Well, bummer. But like I said, I really wasn't expecting that to fix it. Well, I'm back, and as you can probably hear, it's hot. And I have great news, it fixed the surging problem. It is there just a tiny little bit when you are on light throttle, but in most cases, there was no surging at all. And it seems to be, uh, it seems to have more power. There's one of the things that I've noticed with this car is it has horrible turbo lag uh, and now it's much improved. So we did it or we did something. So the mass airflow sensor was indeed dirty enough to be causing somewhat of a performance issue. Whether or not it means anything else, I don't know, but certainly it was perfectly drivable. It's just now it's a little nicer. And yeah, that's about it for this video. Uh, like I said, I want to, at some point, make true main channel videos explaining all this stuff with a more modern car that I can plug in a code scanner to and actually like use an oscilloscope to show what the sensors are actually telling the computer, what the computer's seeing, and cool stuff like that. But we'll do that in a bit. For now though, thanks for watching this silly video and this silly little car. Oh, and by the way, I'm aware the battery does not have a tie-down strap. I'm sure some of you have just been cringing looking at that. I will look into that at some point, but right now it does not have a tie-down strap. And also, the battery terminal on the negative barely fits on there. I don't know if that's because this is a weird, uh, or I don't know if that's because this is an American battery and they have bigger terminals or what, but I'm aware of those things. I know. I'll fix it.